Welcome to our ComposeCast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I switched my mic stand up. So That's not I, all I, uh, that you switched up, if, yeah, if I understand. Yeah, switched houses. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> feel like um, that would be the bigger one you also you also switched internets move. for a second there we had a we had to drop our usual meeting but <laughs> yeah i'm trying to figure yeah i'm looking at this right now i was should have done this while while we were getting ready um had everything <laughs> i think i need to raise my laptop up or lower my chair more but my chair doesn't go any lower so um i don't know i'm doing well over here moved houses it's <laughs> If you saw the other side, I know you made a comment about my plane wall back here. If you saw the other side, you'd be, it, it, it's a mess. So, no. <laughs> Actually, it's clean. Take my word for it. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Yeah, fair um, enough. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Congratulations it's, it's on, yeah, on, a, yeah, on a clean yeah. room. That's, that's great. <laughs> Thank that's great. You. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, no, <laughs> but, um, I'm excited for today's show. I think we got uh, some more Nextcloud we're diving into mm-hmm, and uh, mm-hmm. a lot of our composed developments. So. Yeah, and and talking about cleaning house too, I wanted to address something in the last episode that I brought up. I was talking about uh, Munich's foray into open source and and their subsequent uh, back 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 stepping back, whatever they they walked it back and they had to. Uh, well, they they didn't have to, but but the deals that they made with Microsoft reverted them back from what ended up being a, a half and half, which was half uh, Linux. I think L I M U X, uh, government run, uh, software, uh, system back to full windows. Right. Uh, however, when I was looking this up, uh, I, ha- I have an article from just about a year ago, May 14th, 2020, that says in a notable U-turn for the city, newly elected politicians in Munich have decided that its administration needs to use open source software instead of proprietary proponents like Microsoft Office. So it seems that whichever coalition was in there before has backtracked what they the the previous administration had had agreed with Microsoft and and I I don't know if we really dove into it but you know this is this is this is a big deal right and it's a big deal because this is germany's third largest and one of its wealthy wealthiest cities uh and by the end of uh the 2000s they were looking for a replacement for microsoft i mean they were still running like windows 95 like anything else was that's terrible right that's um, terrible. Well, I mean, to be fair, like it it moves slowly. D- did you did you hear the interview about the helicopter that le- um that flew on Mars recently? No, uh uh-uh. uh. Yeah, so so this was NASA's kind of they they gave their developers some leeway and they're like we just need you to fly this. You can use something that's a little bit off the rails and they they chose to run Linux on it. Uh, because it was just so so well supported and they had confidence in it. Their infrastructure right now is based off of like Windows ninety five because it still works. They are still paying Microsoft to maintain the for them. Like that it's is terrible. It's old. It I mean it, it takes long time to iterate over stuff to get approval and to go through and you're dealing with real low level code i mean send stuff to the moon you do not have a whole lot of leeway you do not have a whole lot of space to put stuff in there so when they when they decided to change it up they had to use one of the lower priority missions to do that and recently uh they sent whatever it was to, to Mars, some kind of rover, or whatever. And it included uh, an attachment that was basically a, a, a hover drone. It just, it, it had like ro- four rotors and, and, uh, and, and was able to fly up and down and, and stuff like that. And that's the first time any kind of a propeller type vehicle uh, has been, has been put on uh, any kind of planet. So it, it was, it was pretty big. It, it wasn't huge, but it was pretty big. And the engineers got, the okay to use open source software. Like they're using uh, Linux as a kernel. They're using FFmpeg 
to take images and video and, and uh, transcode it before sending it down to kind of minimize it and stuff like that. So they're relying on a lot of these things that we take for granted. And it took them a long time to, to get that. And that's just NASA. That's not you know strictly part of the government facility with people hands on this is engineers who are working on this like and and what munich is is doing here uh is is trying to take all of the administrative overhead all the administrative work and port that over to open source software um right so the the migration to linux was partially successful uh, and, and one of one of the complaints was that they're using a custom implementation they're like we're, we're gonna use we're gonna sure. we're gonna spin our own distro because that's a great idea great yeah great yeah um and, and that was that was frustrating for them and in 2017 they decided to leave that like call it call it a failed experiment and move back to microsoft uh, by 2020 was their end goal um, now, in that time frame, Microsoft moved its headquarters to Munich. Sure. Yeah. I saw that. Because that's what you brought up last week. That they yeah. flipped back. And you were, I think the, what you mentioned last week was that they were going, Microsoft was going to leave if the city of Munich was going to move back to Linux. Exactly. So mentioned. not only, yeah. yeah, not only did they not leave, but they also brought their headquarters there. So, or at least whatever, yeah, whatever headquarters amount. they yeah. have over there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the uh, the former Munich mayor, um, under whose administration the Linux program began, has been candid about the efforts Microsoft went to retain their contract with the city. So, and Microsoft has the power to do it. I mean, we don't have a set of linux lawyers we we don't have that team you know right. or, or or lobbyists or, or what have you right we're just some guys we're going to open source software so microsoft did have that ability and was able to get the right people in the right places i mean you go to any kind of career fair at osu you're going to have the microsoft guys there no surprise um and so they they did start going to migrate back to Microsoft and it says here other proprietary software makers like Oracle and SAP uh, costing a, a, a lot of money. So what I understand there to be then, and, and of course they bring up like digital sovereignty and ownership of data. And um, one of my favorite phrases was uh, public money, public code. Yeah. So if you're going to spend money on it, you know, it has to be, has it should be public. Right. Uh, and so one of one of uh, a study that they did in 2019, one of the recommendations was investing in, in, in more open source software, right? So they are right now looking at doing that again, going going towards that again. I don't I don't know how they're going to do that, um, but I did want to at least call attention to it that it hadn't been forgotten. You know, that that particular experiment may have been scrapped but they are still looking to implement something along those lines so uh happy to see it and just wanted to to correct myself there yeah that'll be interesting to uh see how they go what the migration back to it looks like i mean yeah it's funny that they went they moved they moved to it they moved back to microsoft after the headquarters got moved and then they moved sounds like they're moving away from it again but or, or away from microsoft back to Linux or open source. Now, if you ask me where they went wrong, I think we could both agree on rolling their own distro. I think that's hilarious that they did that <laughs> because that is no easy feat. <laughs> but, well, but <laughs> and it's it's easy to say, you know, uh, just start using a different program um, to people. Uh, but that was people the have I their was macros. People have their right. muscle memory. I mean. People have their preferred applications for a reason. They've they've been doing the same workflow for however long, right. and this is this is what they're comfortable with. And it changes hard. I mean, we've gone over that on this on this program, you know, on this on this podcast time and time again. I mean, change is hard, right? It's it's hard mentally. Um, and I I see that you have an article from the the register that also dives into that as well. Yeah, okay, so this one I loved. It's a uh, word strike fear into admins' hearts. 
one in five workers consider themselves digital experts these days. Yeah, I, I know Excel. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> great, right? You know Excel, right. Think about, so if you just take that home, you say, okay, if you're a digital expert, you go, you go home and you say, all right, one in five families, fine, one in five workers. But who, you don't, they, they're an expert at what? And you said it, you kind of ruined it. You, you're, you, you're an expert at Excel, right? You know how to open Word document and you can write your macro, you can like write your VB macros, great. And they work. Okay, but what about the rest? That's like tip of the iceberg is that you can open Excel and you can write like an equal sum if or, you know, your, get your Excel functions. What about all the back end, right? It's what about the backups? What about upgrading? What about everything else that's required in that administration for both applications and everything you're doing online? And that's what I was thinking about when I read it. I was like, it, it is, I don't know if it strikes fear in you at all. It's if, if one in five people at work told me they're an expert, like from the business side, I would be, yeah, I would be a little concerned. Um, Granted, a well, lot of people so, who work with her in IT, but I mean, I, I can't imagine them administering their servers. Is what it is. What I can't is what I'm kind of getting to. I, I can't. I couldn't imagine it. They. They. I think a lot of people just don't have an idea of what's what's going on on the back end and what what else what all goes into it. And especially this is this is talking about end user stuff, right? So they're they're talking about. You know, half of those surveyed reported that they use applications or web services that they personally obtained for business use. Nice. That's a no-no. No. Gotta love that. <laughs> that is a huge no-no. Gotta just block that stuff from running. <laughs> like, I mean, what are you gonna? You gonna post the you know quarterly earnings on WhatsApp to your you know yes. your sales and marketing group? No, <laughs> I mean, how terrible is that? No, I mean, th and this is this is a broader problem. Uh, this is actually more so called shadow IT, but it's even yeah. worse okay. because this isn't just like technical people doing technical things. This is non-technical people doing. making technical <laughs> decisions. This is <laughs> far worse. <laughs> You know, just even even just administering end users endpoints is is difficult. You you have to you have to manage, like you said, you have to do the administrative stuff. You have to manage backups. You have to uh, make sure that their their updates are installed and and keep everyone to 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 a baseline, right? Um, and, and that's not just for the sanity of everyone around you. That's also for the security of everyone around you, right? Right. And that's for the the sanity of the of the business too, right? It's it's easier to as an organization say hey we're, we're going to standardize on this one thing right like if if someone uses if we have five different chat platforms going on at the same time no one's going to be able to talk to anyone you're going to get a siloed communication and and then everything it, it's not good it is it's just not good you're going to have five different ways of working for five different teams Maybe even five different individuals. Exactly. Like if I if I text my coworker, um, but then she also like hits someone up over Teams, uh, and, but I also talk to them on Slack, uh, and then you know w me and me and Matt over there have a WhatsApp channel. Like it's <laughs> that's terrible. That that's terrible. Terrible. That's terrible. That sounds like a nightmare right there. <laughs> and it it can't be it can't be audited, and you run into HR nightmares if you're if you're a bigger organization, right? And it's it's just setting expectations right and, and it comes down to w one of the the parts of motivation right mastery if i if i can't ma if i if i don't know how to communicate with someone right then i'm not going to ask for their help and i'm not going to do what they ask me to do because i can't communicate with them like part of the mastery is is that communication and setting expectations right and i can't do that if they have like five different ways to get a hold of them and sometimes they respond sometimes they don't and by the way, I'm really happy that we got notifications enabled for you Working. for for Matrix. Yeah, because that's that's made a night and day difference. I mean, we set the expectation that hey, when I ping you, you know, I I'm I'm, I'm either letting you know something or or I'm having an, an yeah. issue or whatever. And then at least you can see it and then make that decision rather than 
than coming in, Not, you know, a day and a half yeah. later, you know, and, and said, oh, <laughs> did this get fixed? And I'm sitting here like, no. <laughs> no, I'm still waiting. So that's, that's been night and day, you know, setting those expectations, making sure we're all on the same page. And you can't do that when everyone thinks they're right. a digital expert. Exactly. So I liked so, it. I thought it was hilarious. I mean, it, it's, it's exactly what you said, though. It's non-technical people implementing technical things, and it's a nightmare. Yeah. And how do you solve it? I mean, the, the answer here is... Standard, training guys. someone has to, yeah i mean okay a at some point you're gonna have to have a top-down edict that says hey you know what we're gonna we do it this way yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're gonna do it this way sorry and that that goes against all the touchy-feely well i mean we we covered it that's the affiliate type of leadership style where they sit down and then they go through and make sure everyone's on the same page and say okay are you good oh you want to use that oh like it's it's okay part of the democratic too well you can use that and he can use that and you to play nice together right it's like at some point you got to start speaking the same language to each other right you can't have someone speaking portuguese and someone else speaking right. english and they don't understand each other you know have them both learn portuguese i don't i don't care i don't care just that's the solution right I mean, get on the same page yeah so that was that was an interesting article I like that one yeah and then this uh, third one here you know, I, I saw it uh, a reddit reddit post you had yeah you yeah go over that one yeah I saw some comments on it I of course I jumped to the comments um, of course do you want to explain do you want to go dive into that one uh, it's it's real simple. Uh, it's just like what is a good download number for yeah. your your podcast, right? Yeah. Uh, and the the source here is the podcasthost dot com, which they're legit enough. Um, and they say average podcast downloads. What's a good gauge for my podcast? Uh, and so saving you several clicks and much scrolling. Uh, if we just want to get to the numbers. It would be if you have more than 26 downloads, you're in the top 50% of podcasts. That's from Buzzsprout, right? So okay, what happens? Okay, okay. What happens typically, um, and and we do this too, right? Is so your podcast episode isn't hosted at Apple if it's on iTunes. It's not hosted at uh, where's where's another one. Um, at any Spotify. of the services, Google or Spotify. It's not hosted there, right? They will provide you redirects and, and they will they will grab your podcast to, to give it to someone, right? But your actual download numbers are coming typically from just one place. And that's why it's still easy to have an RSS feed because it's always going to be that, that singular place. So what they ended up doing is they said everyone who is on Buzzsprout, which is a platform to publish the actual media, the MP3s or AUG files or whatever, um, they can track those stats fairly accurately. Uh, so they say, uh, if your new episode gets within seven days of its release, um, more than 26 downloads, you're in the top 50% of podcasts, 72 in the top 25. 231 in the top 10, 539 top 5, and 3,062 is the top 1% of all podcasts. And that's within the first week. That's not just like the day it comes out. That's that's over a bit of time. Yeah. Get, so, let people catch, give people a minute to catch up. Um, it's interesting. You know what? I really like... I don't know if you remember way back. Uh, Jason Stapleton had his post and it was uh, the cutoffs for I think it was getting I think it was growing podcasts and I think the first the first number if I'm not mistaken here you're, you're gonna have to correct me I think it was 600 or five to 600 does that sound right it does it yes. was, it's yeah is that it was like it goes all the way up to there for, well I guess this is for subscribers not views but same I kind of think of them similar yeah I kind of think of one one in the same um it goes up to about 500, 600, and then it kind of wanes a little bit. And then at that point, it either 
takes off to that next, I think you said three to 5,000 is the next jump from there. Or it just kind of level, you know, it just either level, you know, kind of levels off if nothing changes. So, well, and I that's his... bring that one up because it was one of those interesting things that, you know, just made me think about it as I was looking at this post. Which is certainly his interpretation of the several podcasts that he has, which is, which is fine. Um, and it, it seems to match these numbers too, you know, getting into the five, 600 downloads, uh, per, per week, you're in the top 5%, uh, and you get 3000, 5,000, whatever you're in the top 1% of podcasts there. So that's, that's pretty cool. Right. I, I mean, it's it's a it's a way to gauge how you're doing. I'd say we're we're comfortably um, around that top 50 percent number. We're, we're comfortably around 26 downloads. Um, so so the next I mean, if, if we want to break it down, we jump, could we could shoot up, yeah. for 72. Right. And then after that, 231. Right. So and, and, and keep going. It's very hard with podcasts to get an accurate number. So I was I was blown away and super happy to see this and see that yeah and 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 kind of get that but i'm like oh okay hovering right around 50 percent. i'm totally okay with that happy with that yeah right made it past the average of eight episodes a run so <laughs> I, was, I was gonna say what, what, is this 22 23 21? 23 okay okay yeah so we're doing pretty you good you better put a star you better put a star near that you better put a star near that for what uh, for oh. I think it was episode seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> My little one-off. Hey, send me any questions <laughs> the next three days. I'm just uh, gonna call it twenty-three. Screw it. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll count I it like as a it. full episode. I like it. It works. But, I think we said we were going to twenty-five. I. This is my favorite. Um, this is getting way off topic now, so I'll make it quick. Before we started the show, this is almost a. I guess a year oh, would have been. Getting February. Closer to a year ago now. It was February. Yeah. 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 Um. What was I gonna say? Oh, the recommended uh, advice for starting a podcast is have content for twenty five episodes. And here we are at twenty three. So. Oh, and we're full we're got a lot more. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say we got a lot of content. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I am. I'm loving this. I think it's it's super sustainable, and that's what I like to do. Right. I don't like to do one offs. It's and I'm not going to get into this, but that's the reason I don't like NFTs. Don't think they're yeah. sustainable, right? But I, I, I like this, you know, having... Okay, having that came news. out of nowhere. That that came out of nowhere. The NFT thing came out of nowhere. That, that I just should don't, not have been <laughs> I just don't think it's sustainable, but we can dive into that another time. Actually, probably not a bad idea to do a grab bag on one of these days. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to I'm not gonna be nice about it, but I can go into it. Uh but I, I, you know, and, and, and our compose is the same way, right? We're, we're offering a sustainable service, right? We're trying to sustain these open source developers. We're trying to right. sustain, you know, the, the people who care about the, the infrastructure, right? We're trying to create something where, where we can, we can have an entire ecosystem that is, that is ethical, right? That, that sustains itself, that can, that can operate on the long term scale, right? This is something that can be sustained for years and years and years and years to come. This isn't something Google's going to pull, right, two years after, after it starts, right? This is something that we're, we're using established tech, we're using, you know, established best practices, and we're moving forward at a steady pace. And anyone who wants to, to join on, I mean, the the value proposition, and I know we just put that video out there, but part of the value proposition here is is we're doing things the right way. We're doing them the right way, the sustainable way, the secure way. So if, if that's something you care about, hop on board, right? Head over to rcompose.com. Sign up for the newsletter, if nothing else. So you get you get notified about these new episodes and, and like the value proposition video we just put out, which I think is amazing, right? I, I had so much fun putting that together. Uh, and, and I, I just, I really want to pe bring people in that care about that. And with that, I think we'll go into some of the news around some of those services. Okay. Yeah. That sounds great. So this one was, so this I one was. I couldn't believe this one. <laughs> so it was Bitwarden. Bit well. This was great. I was in, I was in their chat. Wanna... 
like a couple i was uh in their in their chat a couple weeks ago maybe and they were just kind of thrown around like they had a whole like like ch- like people were just chiming in and like oh you know if you have to change the name you could do like light warden or like light pass or like you know bit locker bit you know and, and they're just like throwing around names and they're like how did this get stuck where what, <laughs> what what's going on here and what what ended up hap- what, or what ended up starting this i think is something with the the bitwarden guys said hey we want to separate this name or or maybe it was just the developer i don't know whatever uh, but bitwarden rs's 1.21 release implemented a renaming of the project. It renamed from Bitwarden RS to Vault Warden. And in the chat, I did see uh, Danny uh, Garcia mention that if he had to start again, he would have named it something different, right? He just kind of yeeted it out there and said, all right, it's Bitwarden but Rust, so Bitwarden RS. And and so it was it was coming, I guess. Uh, but he said due to user confusion and to avoid any possible trademark brand issues with the original server or official server, this project is going yeah. to be renamed to Vault Warden. This rename might mean you will make need to make some changes to your setup. Uh, so it's it's fairly simple. You, everything is just changing from Bitwarden RS to Vault Warden, and that's about the totality of it. So uh, yeah, I don't know if you saw the a, one thing of note was um i mean obviously the name got changed but the image the images got also updated i guess or was that going forward i thought i thought everything got re. i i I don't have to look at the release notes right now i was under the impression everything got re-tagged no so not everything got re-tagged it is from 1.21 forward so and that, that actually comes in that's that's relevant because we just did a migration and slash update slash stable 2.7 release, which we'll hit in a second here. Uh, but we did keep pointing at the Bitwarden RS image because that has 1.20 because one minor version behind. And at the time we upgrade to stable 2.8 and include 1.21, we're going to bump that to vault warden instead so we're gonna we're gonna sw- switch it around and instead of pointing to bit warden rs because it doesn't have one of 21 we're gonna point to the vault warden, vault warden. docker yeah. images it's uh and you know it's all different repos and yada 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 but i mean it it's the same configuration same everything else yeah yeah so nothing should change and we should just be fairly the same But yeah, I did. I did think that was interesting. Um, yeah, I completely messed up this. I would have liked that uh, Light Warden name. Honestly, now that you got it in my head first, I really that like was that. Vault, Vault Warden. I looked at, it, I was like, oh, okay, it makes sense. But I think it Light was Warden. like Light Vault or something like that. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's good. That's good. They did some kind of like unofficial poll or whatever, and then the devs all kind of talked about it and just moved. They it said over, vault. Yeah. War- I was, well, and and that's even weird too because like Hashicorp's vault, like I mean that's already a thing, right there, yeah. But they they said that that was good enough for them apparently. Close enough. Yeah, I guess. All right, so we have a couple developments here uh, to touch on. Uh, so the R Compose developments. A uh, couple things. The first one, uh, the newsletter. Uh, sign up on rcompose.com, Jack, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, I'm excited for this one. Um, it's a really easy one, honestly. It's a quick fix. Uh, basically, go to rcompose.com, and you will check out now that we have a sign up for our newsletter right on the front page instead of having it shoot uh, I can't even think of where we had it now. It was, it was just, it was, you really had to dig for it. I guess it was on the Art Compose cast site, but now it's out there. Um, if you go to artcompose.com, you'll, you'll see this brand new pretty UI and you'll have that sign up form right there. Along with that, a real small update with that was um, 
updating the actual form. So we do use MailChimp and updating that MailChimp form to match our branding. If you are there's interested still in some, that, yeah, there's still some there's, UX design that I'd like to iron out there. But we'll see. We'll see. Uh, we, we, we are going to continue to evolve this during Q2. I mean, that's what we're hitting yeah. on that and Portal. So, uh, And speaking of, uh, we implemented one of the coolest things that we've had in a while that I'm excited about, which is uh, allowing Portal to clone the environment to disk. So this is, this is step one uh, in the ability for Portal to s- control an instance by itself. And there's a lot of moving parts, uh, a lot of things yet to be implemented. Um, and actually, Jack's working on step two right now, which is displaying that within the UI. But, you know, getting the architecture of, you know, where the stuff should go and where it needs to be closed down to yeah. and how environment variables get set in Rails and how Rails... D- I'm not going to rail against Rails, but Rails, man. Mm. Mm-mm. Don't like it? it Something it, against it? It throws me for a loop every it's single picky. time. It's picky. It is very picky. I, I I don't hate it though. I mean it's it's Pythonic enough and that's kind of my benchmark. Okay. Okay, fair enough. I, I'm happy you didn't say Java or anything else. <laughs> no. Didn't ex- didn't expect you to, but no. glad you no, did. No. Um but yeah, so so we got that ready and and I think as we keep coming out with these episodes, there's going to be more and more things and you're going to start to see how this builds on itself and, and it's going to look pretty sweet. So um, as long as Jack gets his part done in the next week, that would be great. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. that'd be great. Stop, it's starting to sound like uh, Bill <laughs> Womberg over there. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I actually caught my manager saying that non-ironically the other day. I was like, dude, you've lost it. You've lost it. (laughs) All right. And Uh, then, uh, yeah, you got to talk about Stable 2.7 here. I will in a second. Um, Is there more you wanted to add on the portal stuff? The the only thing to say, uh, there's one thing after that. And like I said, the formatting got all messed up, so I'll fix that later. Sorry about that. Okay, um, yeah. But the value of our compose. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Episode or uh, video is out. Um, so that's that's the little thing we release on YouTube. It's the first video on our channel page, I think, for anyone who's not subscribed. Uh, but it's it's the results of you know Jack and I getting together uh, that weekend a, a month ago or whatever that was about four weeks ago, and recording the the videos uh and and that uh we got two more in the works coming out soon one of them's coming out really soon as, as soon as i can figure out the coloring um but apart from that <laughs> once i get that fixed uh that that should be coming up and uh, excited to see that uh, but yeah the 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 value i mean that's that's more like a value proposition if if you're listening to this podcast you probably already know what that is but i think it's a good nutshell uh for anyone who's unfamiliar with it did you want to say anything about that jack i know we spent some i liked it i'm glad i'm glad you put it on the front page of our youtube channel um we had fun making it I, i can tell you that that's it's it makes me laugh every time makes me smile a little bit uh so yeah, I remember. It was a good day when we did that. It was fun, um, but definitely go check it out if you haven't seen it. For sure. Uh, and then, lastly, Jack, what you were talking about here. So, compositional rule two not seven uh, was released here. So, I'm actually going to pull up that link. So, there is, there was a pull request uh, that was merged to get everything up to date. Uh, and basically, what we're doing here is we did all of the minor version bumps to get ourselves back up to what we needed to be back up to one minor version uh, behind whatever the current is for all of our upstream projects. Uh, so for instance, MariaDB uh, got updated, uh, Camboard got updated, WordPress got updated, Bitwarden got updated, Firefly got updated, Jekyll got updated, Rundeck got updated, and Bookstack got updated. So everything we've been talking about uh, for the past couple months uh, kind of all slammed together hit home uh and and i 
want to be doing this more frequently. Uh, it's just I'm getting back in the. I'm trying to trying to hit that balance, hit that sweet balance, and and get everything back uh, that I can. So there were a couple other things, like one of the things, uh, the book sack volume wasn't owned correctly. Uh, so I implemented that kind of fix. That was a master, just didn't make its way back yet. Um, you'll see a little Easter egg of what's to come, and we have an R Compose Bot read-only key for cloning some of our environments. Uh, like I said, that's that's part of the cool stuff that's that's coming down the pipe. Um, Rundex database driver actually got updated to the MariaDB database driver. MySQL's license change is really coming to hit them hard. That's that's not good. Not good yeah. for them. Uh, and then lastly, WordPress, uh, we automated the database up updates. Um, having that WP CLI functionality just opens up so many doors for us. So that was really easy to do. Uh, but that's all the updates I had for the developments. Uh, Jack, I am going to let you take over the integration discussion. So this is going to be your episode from here on out until we get to the grab bag. Of okay. Course. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, I was, you got me a little nervous there. I'm not taking grab bag. <laughs> um, or here we are. Next cloud episode X of X. It's I like four, is this four? Five, I think I last time I said yeah five. Okay, so we're at episode five for next cloud, and I wanted to talk about a few. Uh, uh, I picked three third party applications. I think it's perfect. The title of the show is Next Cloud Hash of Third Party Apps, and you you could take a guess at why I picked it. I think you know why after <laughs> after the first. Um, after taking a look here at the first third-party application I picked out, yeah, that's it perfect. Is, uh, not only does it, sum. it's not only does sum. it rhyme, but like, yeah, yeah, it makes yeah. sense. So, the three I picked, uh, just wanted to run through them briefly, was checksum, EPUB reader, and only office. I feel like I picked the three easiest. I don't, I, I don't know. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. I really. I, Checksum was one I hadn't used before, and I picked it up. I saw it was out there, and I said, oh, my gosh. You know, To be able to send someone a file and then say, hey, this is a hash for it as well, uh, you know, just in case they wanted to confirm that's the actual file they downloaded or whatever they need. I don't use it all the time. Um, I'll tell you what, though. In, oh, in my work environment, at least, we have to – hash everything uh and confirm the hash we downloaded from whatever site is the same as you know what what we have on our local machine um in my personal life though i don't use checksum i'm not md5ing files all the time i don't wake up and go i can't wait to md5 this <laughs> file today but it's a cool feature if you ask me so i wrote up you know if you need to confirm the file you're sharing with someone else that it's the same file you sent to them, use a hash. I, I kind of wrote up a little sales pitch here for it. Uh, so there's a third-party application you can add, and you can generate it for every file. I was, So when you share a file, you can share the hash, confirm it. Now, the one thing that they didn't have was sharing a folder, which I was just kind of expecting them to put... I, I don't know how easy of a feature it would be. I Almost zipping it up and then hashing the zip and then sending the zip over shared. I, I was kind of thinking about it. It just sounds, it's just easier just to let it go and only do files, but would have been a nice feature to have. So that's kind of the one limitation I found now for the hashes that you can pick out. It's pretty crazy. It's MD five, SHA one, SHA two fifty six, SHA three eighty four, SHA five twelve, CRC 32 and CRC 32 B. Now, I was familiar with all of them except CRC32, and I had to. I'm actually looking it up right now. I was trying to think. Okay, is it cyclic it's, redundancy it's, check or something? Yeah. Like that? Yes. Boom. Yeah. So I think it's more more or less for. Is that for just data? Pair? Integrity. Is that just a? Well, that's. I mean, that's what a hash is. It just confirms data integrity. It doesn't do any encryption. It doesn't, you know, secure the file. It's just saying, all right, if I we talked in Bitcoin what a hash is, right? If I take the same yeah. input, can I get the same output, right? And the output's always going to be random, except when you give it the exact same input. 
I thought CRC was for like bit parity. I, I don't know why I was thinking bit parity for some reason. I guess it'd be I mean, the same it, thing. Hashes, same hashes thing. can be yeah. used in bit parity, yeah. but yeah. So there isn't. It's it's a small third party application. If you need to hash your files, it's out there. Check it out. Uh, the next one was the EPUB reader, which I thought I don't know why I thought that, I thought there was one by default in just out of the box with Nextcloud. Was it because PDF? they used to include it by default out of the box? And so, so was that so removed? That, there's there's actually some history to that, but I'd like to hear what what's going on with this one. This one is sw- this one is pretty sweet, honestly. I really liked it. It's so you know, with everything going digital, there's no reason not to have a digital book, right? That was that's my big shill on this. Uh, with the EPUB reader, EPUB, it's CBZ files and PDF. It's you're not getting into anything crazy here. Basically, you're able to read files. Uh, some of the major features include table of contents, bookmarks, and seamless reading. Although the major features Although these are major features of readers, it's nice to have it that are nice to have out of the box. You know, the one thing I really liked about Nextcloud was being able to pick up wherever you left off on whatever device. The other thing I wanted to note here just for you was that it does support a dark mode for reading. Just thought I'd toss that out there. Nice. I know you, I know you love your dark mode. Um, but really with the EPUB reader, you're getting it's it's similar to any it's similar to any EPUB reader that's out there. I would say it's just embedded into Nextcloud, which I actually do prefer. Versus, I don't know if you use uh, your browser at all to read EPUB files or PDFs, just like Not Vivaldi or Firefox. Typically, I, I, I find myself doing that quite a bit. Uh, the nice thing I like about this is being able to pick up right where you left off. Um, and it's embedded into Nextcloud. So did you have some history behind the EPUB reader that you wanted to share with? Yeah, was there, was, there was an old version of this out there on the interwebs that got yanked for some reason. I forget, I forget the history. Um, but what I ended up doing, and if you go in the role, you'll actually see the history of the code there. I was grabbing the archive of it, unpacking it, changing the supported version number manually, and installing it. That's crazy. No way. So because you're just there ripping was an un- there you was were ripping it up. You were rip. Let me get this straight. You were ripping an unsupported version, unpacking it, going into a file, changing to say, "Hey, this is supported." And then deploying it? Yes. Because it worked. That's, that's crazy. It worked. It was, I, I think I also had to do one other thing, like I had to change like a Python library name or something like that, but it, it worked um, because there was no EPUB reader because for some reason they were something, Just something about the API incompatibilities, but it still worked itself. So I'm like, why I not? just want an yeah. EPUB reader. Just yeah, put that on there for. I got plenty of books on there. I want to read them. So, and, and I do read mostly on mobile, but like same same deal. So yeah, that was that was frustrating. Um, so I'm glad to see that there's actually an official way to do that now because that was versus backport <laughs> change code. It's pretty bad. That's <laughs> why. I mean it. Like anything else, right? It taught me kind of how the applications are, are, yeah. are set up. You know, they have a they have a file in there that says it's supported up to this version number, or able to operate in this version number, and if it's if the next cloud version is higher than this number, then don't allow it to run. And what you can do is you can just change that Flip and the, yeah, yeah. Flip the look at Ant Hacker Man over there <laughs> flipping the version number, allowing it to run. <laughs> Well, and you actually ran into that with the uh, the mail thing uh, when you were looking at the other apps because you had to have that one updated. Yeah, I did. Um, that was one of the tricky things that we I kind of ran into with third-party apps and app applications in general was that, you know, you go 
to upgrade next cloud and you're the newest version major version minor version bump whatever what have you and next thing you know you log into next cloud and there's no applications that your third-party apps are gone and you're like what's going on this what happened yeah and sure enough you have to just open up the apps page where they all are and just open them all up that way or upgrade them all that way. Um, or you can use a cool, cool, cool little script. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was pretty, pretty fun to implement and, and kind of dig down into that. And, and that's why I wasn't too afraid of implementing what I did, right. The, the application updates. So, uh, yeah. So I think uh, yeah. we be- beat that one to yep. death. Um, what else? Yeah, oh, and, and one the, thing uh, I did oh. see. One thing I did see is that it does support bookmarking, which is huge for me. Yeah, it's yeah. huge for me. And I mean, talking about syncing across devices, that's exactly where you need it. You need it, right. you know, to to sync across. Well, if you want to pick up your book, you you know, the thing I think about is picking it up from a laptop and then going to mobile. Well, not only that, but when I when I read it, I'm probably going to read on mobile, right? That's just that's just how I'm going to read. But then when I'm putting together my show notes, what I'm going to want is the bookmarks that I highlighted, right? When I was reading it, I'm going to want to pull those out and throw those into the show notes right. so I can have my talking points. Like, and if that doesn't transfer across devices, then I got to start manually typing things out like I had to with this thing because it's paper. <laughs> I'm not doing that again. Paper book. <laughs> How what dare they? That? How dare they? What is this world <laughs> coming got, to? You could have you got the mobile. You, you, don't sit here and act like you could have got the EPUB version. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> the last one I had here was uh, Only Office. I love this one. I absolutely love this one. It's it, it's so nice to have. Only Office oh. is basically allows you to view, edit, and collaborate on text documents, spreadsheets, and presentations within NextCloud using... Okay, only Office Docs. Basically, instead of Collabra, instead of having to spin up a full Collabra server, you're able to edit seamlessly whatever, you know. I think it supports multi it supports multiple document types in just straight out of Nextcloud. And you and I you and I when we tested it out um a couple of weeks ago when I was up. You're like, hey, are you seeing these changes? Now granted you couldn't find the backspace button on uh mobile but eventually i, think, I did eventually i, I pep, did pep but that was pep, pep. <laughs> so again with this one uh the one the one thing i really enjoyed or i guess what's there to enjoy about editing text document not <laughs> much <laughs> presentation not much excel not much um that it did support it did support that ability for us to you know, real time edit of the same document. So call me a cop, a cop out. Uh, I don't know if you remember the one time in Open Source Club when you when I used the edit in Git in GitHub. In GitHub, I opened the uh, edit, did a commit in GitHub, and then submitted the PR all through GitHub. I didn't all through the GUI. Uh, this is my cop out. This is my essential cop out for editing documents now. Instead of having to download the document, open the document close the doc save the document close the document re-upload the document now i can just open it up you know fix the typo or whatever and then back to it so it's another it's another jack cop out i guess if you want to call it that (laughs) well i mean it it works i mean it's it's something if i want to just make a change to the file and you know you you pair this with syncing a directory right and then i can i can work on my desktop i can do everything and then in the middle of whatever dinner hopefully not a date but like i whip, whip out my phone and, and i was like oh i wanted to make a change to that one you know i got a great idea and you know jot it down in in our q2 planning document or whatever and um boom it's it's there so that that makes it easily accessible and i mean come on to be fair who's not on mobile almost everywhere these days right stuff has ha- right. stuff has to be accessible when you're on the move and this makes that available to you. I don't, I can't install a office suite on my phone. I just need to be able to edit a file and 
this is how you do it, right? This is how you do it in a lightweight kind of way that works with what we have set up. And to be honest, it's pretty slick. Very. And, well, the one thing I really like about OnlyOffice, another thing I really like about it, you don't need collab, you don't need to install a whole other service to run it. Even if you're running this as an you know independent, you basically have these features available to you out of the box, you know, if you install the application. So, and something that out, that's out there, just ready to go, basically ready to go. What did they say? No, no installation, no something required, no. Really just a, uh, a short, short integration discussion. Just really wanted to cover what, I, I think what I wanted to get into more or less is what's out, what's out there, how to use it, why do you, maybe more of the why, why to use it. Or when would, when, when would I ever use this? There's a lot of stuff you could do by hand. There's a lot of ways to do it easier, though. So this yeah. is one of those ways. Um, so I think next episode, we're, we might just continue down this path. Uh, I don't know. I've, I've got a couple of applications I would probably want to touch on. Yeah. But we'll see where that goes. That sounds good. Other than that, I don't have anything else to add it was a quick integration discussion honestly I, I i don't have anything else if you don't have anything else i think i'm i am excited to get into a grab bag here yeah well and and what we have here is i wanted to go over how to win friends and influence people like i said the physical book that i'm currently having to copy stuff manually by hand from Torture. but it's worth it it's worth it. I, I, I think it's worth it. I I have to say, I think this is maybe the fourth time I've read this book in my life. And there's a reason I keep coming back to it is because it's it's so good. It's it's really good. Now, none of these are my actual highlights because I don't highlight books like that. Uh, but it there there are a lot of examples but between a lot of the examples are some really great nu nuggets right so so what i wanted to do is is make my own kind of uh bookmarks of them or, or, or take out the quotes that that, that i liked and, and kind of go through them uh, the book is laid out well suited to to something like this to to this kind of discussion uh because it does come in four sections four parts if you will uh, the first part that we're going to go over today uh, being fun to fundamental techniques in handling people. So he, this is his introduction to the book. Uh, it's just three chapters. Um, and, and something I love about this book is that, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty fat, you know, whoever's watching the video, it's, it's a fat book, but it's broken up into very manageable chunks. You can either read part by part, which would take you, you know, a couple hours per part, um, or you could read it chapter by chapter, and honestly, chapters go by in they're maybe quick. five minutes. They yeah, they're very quick. Yeah, so it was it was really good because I had reread this uh, probably about a month ago, or, or just short of a month ago. I think right when I was wrapping up my other grab bag topic, uh, I was wrapping up this book as well. So I I kind of wanted to naturally transition into this, and uh, so I um, went back to the first sections, uh, the first three chapters and pulled out some notes that I wanted to go over today. Uh, before I do that, though, Jack, did you have any uh, thoughts about this? I mean, have you read this book before? Or, uh, I've read the book. I have read, I thought it was four, when you said three chapters, I thought it was four parts. It's four I parts. The first, the first part is three chapter. Okay. First, first part is three chapters, yeah. Okay, okay, I got you now. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I thought it was four. Yeah, I don't know why I was thinking. I don't know why I just got confused there. No. Yeah. Uh, I have. I I like how it's broken down part by part, though. Um, I I can't recall the top the four parts off the top of my head. I'd have to glance over. I'd have to take a look back at the book. Um, but I know I, I know I'd planned on doing, part two. Yes. For the yes. next grab bag. We've we've planned on you doing part two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but. Have you, uh, you, you know the history of this book? Like, it was written, like, forever ago and stuff. I'm trying to think. Wasn't it written by a guy named Dale Carnegie? Do you know what, what is the history of the, I, I honestly don't know the history of the book. I, I, I mean, just just the fact that it was written, you know, back in the 1930s, right? 
back in back in the big industrial boom you know of of america and um by someone who was very close to a lot of the the upper echelon of of people in that day and it touches on a lot of different things a lot of different uh really psychology that that just wasn't known before right people people weren't studying this stuff before like that was that was resigned to like the the crazy people trying to figure out how people thought and sitting around thinking to figure out how people think and you know he what what Dale Carnegie does a really good job of in the book is uh, grabbing some real world examples and and going through that now he I know he did teach a uh, seminar series uh, which the book kind of came from so he has a lot of people that he's met through that who have given their testimonials as to you know after going into this the seminar right i took the these specific steps right because you said do this that and the other thing and implemented them and this was the result right so there's there's a lot of good examples uh, that go over that but he does stick to a lot of the 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 why so like the the first part of the first chapter here is if you want to gather honey don't kick over the beehive yeah great way to open the book so what you would think would be sane advice right something something that's that's pretty straightforward let's let's see how he dove dove into it here so the first question he wanted to ask is how do people regard themselves so he took a couple quote from two of the more notorious gangsters ever and one of them uh francis two-gun crowley um after this story is crazy dude was in the car with his girlfriend or whatever cop comes up and like knocks on his window and dude turns around unloads an entire revolvers worth of lead into the cop gets out grabs the cop's gun and shoots him in the head right the, the, hence the name two guns crowley right so then he he uh hightails it uh, away and um the cops have him in in a hotel room or something you know and he's it's a it's a shootout or whatever and he's he's sitting there he's penning his last you know will and testament or whatever and one of the things he writes down here is he he says that under my coat is a weary heart but a kind one one that would do nobody any harm like that that's how he saw himself he saw himself as someone who would not do anyone any harm uh, similarly, you know, Al Capone, I don't think he needs any introduction, but he said, I've spent the best years of my life giving people the lighter pleasures, helping them have a good time, and all I get is abuse, the existence of a hunted man. People see themselves, you know, yeah. people people regard right. themselves very highly. Right, of course. A lot of people would, would much rather think that they're doing the best for the people they care about rather than, you know, harming other people, and 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 that's part of what he wanted to get across uh, in this in this chapter. So, keeping that in mind, the second the follow up question he asked, and and these two may not seem directly related at first, is why is criticism dangerous? Right. So so we know that people regard sure. themselves very highly. Now we have to ask ourselves why is criticism dangerous? Uh, and he has a couple points here. So, so the first point is that it wounds a person's precious pride. And people who regard themselves very highly are, are going to be more prideful. But deep down inside, I mean, it's we we all have a ton of pride. I mean, my one of my one of my favorite phrases to think to myself is whenever you know, like. You, you you bump your hip on a table or something or like smack your hand into the wall just just do yeah. something stupid like that it doesn't really hurt but you say ow anyways because it hurts your pride because you're sitting up like i've been in this body for how many years now and i still can't yeah. like navigate it yeah right <laughs> yeah yeah ow my pride right that hurt <laughs> it hurt my pride and that sucks you don't want anyone calling you on it you you just want to kind of slink under the covers there but you know people's pride is important um and talking about importance, I mean, criticism hurts someone's sense of importance. And we're going to get to people's sense of importance later. But, I mean, if uh, pride is, is not always a bad thing, you have to have pride to take chances, you know, and, and, and take risk on to do that. And, and to do that, you also have to have a sense of importance. And 
and if you criticize someone you're gonna you're cutting away at their sense of importance you say well you didn't think you you don't know the thing that you think you know as well as you thought you knew it and that that hurts anyone because if if they're honest with themselves they're gonna they're gonna take a hard look at themselves and say yeah you're right and and that's best case scenario worst case scenario they're gonna lash out at you um because criticism arouses resentment i mean you you playing out don't like someone who's calling you out on you know doing something wrong even if you know it's wrong even if everything else is is lined up right if if they're calling you out on it you're going to be resentful that that someone like it like i said you know if i if i do something that's embarrassing right i would rather slink away and no one see right the worst thing that can happen is someone calls attention to that thing that i didn't want anyone to see and I'm going to be resentful to that person. So, so criticism is, is dangerous, very dangerous in, in those three ways. Um, and immediately what it results in is putting people on the defensive. Um, and, and subsequently, like as, as a result of taking that stance, as a result of taking the defensive stance, it immediately results in, in making the other person strive to justify themselves in doing the wrong thing. So, in criticizing, in trying to call out something that did wrong, you're going to have the exact opposite effect that you intended. The thing isn't going to be done right. Rather, you're going to be maligned, even if it's just in this person's mind, and the thing isn't going to get fixed because it's going to be justified instead of right. instead of fixed. So, so criticism is is very dangerous because when you start to attack. The way that people regard themselves, right, and and their pride, right, you're you're gonna arouse resentment. You're gonna put the person on the defensive, and you're gonna make them strive to justify themselves. And it, it could be as simple as it could be as simple as, well, why were you ever doing it that way, right? Or didn't you know that there was a different way to do it, right? As, as soon as those words leave your lips. Right. The first thing that'll pop into the other person's mind is, well, they asked me to justify myself. Right. So Here it is. I can't. Right. I, I've got to. I've yeah. got to play defense or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Defensive. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that's definitely something to avoid. And, and, and this is going to come back a, a lot. Trust me, this is this is the opening part of the book. These three chapters are the the fundamental part that he wants to build on. So so you're gonna you're gonna hear a lot of this in the resulting chapters. Um, another another thing he says here is that uh, fundamentally it does not convince people that they were wrong or need to change. Right. I mean, and we went over that. It you know they're they're gonna strive to justify themselves. They're they're not gonna try to change. So a, a good example, and, and like I said, this book is littered with examples, and it being written at that time, uh, a lot of people were studying Civil War and Revolutionary War and uh, a, lot of, a lot of personalities around that time frame. Uh, so Abraham Lincoln had a letter that he wrote to General Meade. Uh, at this point in time, uh, it was right after the Battle of Gettysburg which was the high tide of the, uh, the, the rebels push into the north. And General Lee, Southern General, was trapped behind, uh, between a flooded river and the, the northern army. And General Meade was the general of the northern army. And he was given orders to attack. Well... He didn't attack, right? He he had literally the entire Southern Army sitting there as waiting ducks. Now he didn't attack. He called together all of his generals, kind of had a powwow, you know, kind of the affiliative leadership style or the democratic leadership style, where something more fit into an emergency, right? Because they had some Need some it. kind of a right. a time crisis there would have been more appropriate, uh, and so as a result. Lincoln drafted up a letter to General Meade, you know, and, and he phrased it excellently. He's like, uh, I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the mis misfortune involved in Lee's escape after he crossed the river after it was done flooding. Um, and, you know, he was just saying that it was, um, 
you know, it was unreasonable. It would be unreasonable to expect, and I do not expect that you can now affect much. Your golden opportunity is gone, and I am distressed immensely because of it. So very, very choice words. Uh, they're very, very flowery, but nonetheless, you can you can feel the tension there. Um, Mead never got the letter. That letter was never sent. How about that? Okay. There, there was just no reason for him to hear that, right? I, I and and if you put your put your feet in Lincoln's shoes, he was doing the same thing to Meads. He's like, well. All right, so he's just gone through the Battle of Gettysburg, which, by the way, was the bloodiest, I think the bloodiest battle in the Civil War, which is the bloodiest war in America, at least. And he's like, if I had seen that many people die, if I'd seen right, that much right. carnage and casualty, I think I would probably be a little bit hesitant to have everyone charge right back into battle again, right? I would want to kind of make sure everyone was okay mentally because there's a lot of stuff that happened there. And he ended up not sending it because that it, it wouldn't have accomplished anything, right? All, all it would have done is right. created more tension. And even though it was really what he was feeling at the time and I know that we we are in a culture that really values feelings, but it was really what he was feeling at the time. But as a politeness, right, as a way to serve his other man, he said, "No, I'm not. I'm not going to send this. Right, this is not what I need to communicate to him. What I need to communicate to him is is something different. Right, and as a result, he was able to to hold that in. You know, even though you know, you could say the same thing about drafting up an email, right, and never sending it or whatnot." Yeah. But he he ended up holding his tongue, and frankly, that was the best thing he could have done. So that was that was an interesting example. Uh, and 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 Benjamin Franklin had a quote too that uh, Dale Carnegie pulled and put into the book here. He said, "Any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain, and most fools do. But it takes character and self control to be understanding and forgiven." So to wrap it up. The first principle in this book is don't criticize, condemn, or complain. It's not going to get you what you want. It's a good principle. No doubt. I mean, you already covered it. I don't have anything else to add. I don't have any personal uh, anecdotes either. All right. Well, I'll, uh, I'll dive into the, the second chapter. Uh, and this is this is the one that I took the least amount of notes on, so I don't know how this is going to go, but let's let's dive in here. So this is the big secret of dealing with people. Pretty pretty weighty title there, I think. Yeah, um, right, sure. And he does this. He 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 gives all of his chapters really you know crazy titles and tries to hook people in. Part of that you hold sales marketing approach there, but. Uh, I'm not sure this one lives up to the hype, but but I'll touch on that in in part of my summary here. Uh, he he does open the chapter though and says there's only one way to get anybody to do anything, and that is by making the other person want to do it. That's excellent. Actually, actually, that sentence summarizes the entire book. You can just end here. Like if if you're if you're like at your you know, destination. If you're driving to listen to this podcast, you can stop it right here. That's it. That's the, that's that's the rest of the There's book. Nothing else. <laughs> there is nothing else. Exactly. You need to you need to make the other person want to do it, and that's it. Um, but to to dive a little bit deeper into it, he he goes into uh, Doctor John Dewey's uh, research and, and and pulls out what he had done. He said uh, the deepest urge in human nature is the desire to be important. Um, and, and that's a good one. That's a good one to keep in mind, too. And and I would say keep that in the back of your head also throughout the rest of your book uh, because a lot of the ways that you make the other person want to do it is to arouse in them, right, the the understanding that by doing something, they are important. You know, they are important because they need to do this or, or this will lead to their importance, yada, yada. And there are, are, are many things that people would consider to be important to them and, and, and make them important, right? So it could be money, it could be power, it could be influence, you know, what, what have you. There's 
different ways to be important. You know, so maybe someone just wants to be important in another person's life, right? If, uh, you know, especially if your, uh, your significant other, right? Part of what they really would like, right, is is a lot of gifts, right? Maybe they respond positively to, to getting gifts, right? Um, and your desire to be important is to be important in that person's life, right? And and the way that that you show that is is by getting them gifts, right? You you show that you know you're in, you're important to me, and that's that's another way to to kind of generate good relationships between people is is to is to make sure that you you continue to remind them that they are important to you, right? Uh, because if, if you don't say it, how are they ever going to know it? Right. Uh, or, or different ways to show it. Right. So, so that, that could be a way that you, you generate importance. Right. But, but there are just so many different ways to do that. So many, and, and the book will go into, to a couple here. Um, but, but that is a very deep urge in human nature, right? Humans, humans almost crave that type of importance. Right. And, and not just on a certain, survival level right but on like a on like a deeper kind of yeah. the reason i'm surviving has to be some kind of importance I, I have to be important to something therefore i have to survive right and and once you get down to that importance you're able to start working with people and start start helping them right because if, if, if you don't know what's important to them how can you help them uh, so the deepest urge in human nature is the desire to be important uh charles swab uh, follows up and says there's nothing else that so kills the ambition of a person as criticisms from superiors so going right back to criticism right um, there's nothing else that so kills the ambitions of a person as criticism from superiors I never criticize anyone I believe in giving a person incentive to work right uh, p- appealing to their sense of importance. How do you give them incentive? You have to appeal to their sense of importance. And a lot of people would take that, you know, money should be your incentive. Well, absolutely not. That is that is the absolute wrong way to think about it. Right. Right? You have to I mean, maybe money is their way to importance, right? But money is not the end all be all. I will tell you that right now. Right? So, giving incentive of giving a person incentive to work is a, appealing to their sense of importance. Um, so he continues on. So I am anxious to praise, but loathe to find fault. If I like anything, I am hearty in my approbation and lavish in my praise. And that is a direct way to implement making the other person want to do it. Now, I'll go on to that in a second. Um, a note on flattery, however, I wanted to cover because it, you know, if you're if you're hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise, you know, if you if you compliment someone, if you tell them they did a good job, you know, if you if you pile it on, it can start to become flattery. Not just sound like it. You could actually be flattering the person. You you're not meaning it. You know, you're being insincere. It it it's it's not coming from you know a a a something something that you actually care about right so so the note on flattery is that it seldom works with discerning people it is shallow selfish and insincere it ought to fail and usually does sure and i would almost say it usually does and continues to be more probable to do so the longer it continues yeah Right. Maybe if you maybe you could get away with flattering someone once, right? But you can fool all the people some of the time and some of the people all the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time, right? You continue to flatter someone, you ain't going nowhere. So now that we've got flattery out of the way, and we understand that the only way to get someone to do anything is to make them do it, and the biggest motivation for people is the desire to be important. The takeaway of this chapter is to be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise to to heap on the compliments as as people are are doing things that you like to see them doing right now this is all about setting expectations and developing a standard though and this is my commentary on it this can only be provided after the fact and is not a way to proactively make the other person want to do it rather this is a long-term strategy to encourage an environment in which excellence receives honest and sincere appreciation 
right? So, so this is about a long-term cultivating uh, a, a perception of yourself is that if I do good work, I'm going to get rewarded. I'm going to get praised. I'm going to get, you know, approbation, you know, stuff, good stuff is going to happen because I'm doing good stuff and, and setting that expectation, right? And, and, and setting that standard. This is not how do I sweet talk my way into a 50% reduction in my hotel price or something like that. That comes later in the book. This, this right here is about and it, cultivating an environment. And it's, it's great advice for doing so. I just don't want anyone to mistake that, you know, y- this is going to be the only way that you, you appeal to someone's desire to be important, right? This is about creating a culture where their importance will continue to be reinforced, right? right. And, and, and that feels good to everyone. So it's, it's, it's very important. It's, it's very important. So I'm not taking away uh, its importance at all, but I'm saying that this is, this is the way to cultivate a long-term environment, right? Now, the way to get 50% off your hotel bill Oh yeah, we're comes all interested in, in we want to hear that. Come, yeah, comes in the the next part here. So the next chapter is called "He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks the lonely way." Right. This this dude really does love his titles, really does. Totally. But I I found his 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 opening to this chapter even more compelling. He starts. I often went fishing up to Maine during the summer. Personally, I am very fond of strawberries and cream, but I have found that, for some strange reason, fish prefer worms. Can you see where the story goes? Fill me in. How does the rest go, Jack? You're not going to catch a fish with a uh, strawberry and cream there. (laughs) No, you're not. (laughs) But why? You know? And why? Because... they don't care about it. Right. That's, right. Right. You you can't care about what you care about all the time. Right? You need to you need to put yourself in you other people's show, shoes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, uh my fa- well going back here to uh oh, what do you call it? The only way this is the there's only one way to get anybody to do anything and that's by making the other person want to do it. You have to be interested in other people's lives. That's I think that's what this chapter kind of boils down to. I that's kind of that's actually the main thing I took away. I don't know if that's part two or three that I took away from the book is you have to be interested in other people because people don't care. It sounds I don't know what you want to say back, but it's like people don't care. People don't have to care about you, right? They they care about themselves. Yeah. So why talk about what we want? That is childish and absurd. Of course, you're interested in what you want. You're etern- eternally interested in it, but no one else is. The rest of us are just like you. We are interested in what we want. I mean, I didn't even read. I didn't. I didn't even know that was the next quote. But yeah, it fits perfectly. You have to be interested in other people. Yeah, and and you know, he goes on to say the only way on earth to influence other people, right, is to talk about what they want, and then then you get to show them how to get it. Right. Uh, he says action springs out of what we fundamentally desire. And going back to what we said, what do people fundamentally desire? They desire to be important. Right. So action springs out of that. And the best piece of advice which can be given to would-be persuaders, whether in business, in the home, in the school, in politics, is first, arouse in the other person an eager want. He can do this, has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Right. So now we have a thin thread between the two. We have a thin thread between your desire to be important, right? And how do you approach a situation appealing to someone's desire to be important, right? Without any kind of environment or background, right? You arouse in them an eager want, right? Uh, And Owen D. Young follows it up and says, if there's any one secret to success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own, right? So the techniques to arousing in the other person an eager want are going to be varied and and really throughout the rest of the book, right? So there's, there's definitely different 
sub concerns, if you want to say it that way, uh, that people can can latch onto, right? And and we can we can address, right? Parts of you know their desire to be important, but the the overriding part of it is they are desirous to be important, right? So so appealing to that desire, uh, you can start looking at all right. You know how what what do they already want right and how how can i out of that arise an eager want uh, and then how can i put myself in their shoes and see this is this is this is your 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 right. want that we can address for you and and let's let's start using those those shoes to walk forward towards getting that uh, so my commentary on principle 3 here is that here we get to some actionable practical implementable advice however it's much harder than it sounds on the surface this is not something that can be automated or is really even cookie cutter this is not something that can be gleaned from a five minute surface discussion this advice is best implemented for short term convincing between two people who are able to take the time and energy to dive deep into each other's wants and needs additionally this cannot be treated as a simple carrot and stick Uh, you know as as described above, right, the fundamental want in people is to be important. In, in chapter one, we went over the f- or um, two. The fundamental want in people is to be important. This will not work simply with material things, but rather the want must arise from the deep-seated convictions of what's already there. So that's that's my commentary on that. That's that's my take there. Is that. I, I especially, you know, and I went over it with the money thing, but but with anything, it can't simply be material, right? If you're material, you're not it, appealing to the need to be important. Right. It's something deeper than that. Right. It's it's always going to be something deeper than that. I, I cannot remember if it was in this book or not, but one of my one of my favorite examples that always pops into my head and i used to hate books that gave examples because i'm like just get to the point man just give me the logical proof and mock my way through it no no but i'm like this sticks in my head you need the example exactly you need the example to remember it there was this land developer the, the the story goes there was this land developer who tried to get this land for a new strip mall or something like that yeah. and he kept trying and trying and trying and trying and like other people had too because this, this guy owned just like a huge bit of bit of land exactly where they wanted to develop it right and people had come offering him money offering him other properties offering you know whatever right and he always said no he was he was always just stubborn and that's what that's the reason he you know he he didn't really need to give any reasons he just he just kind of told them no well one of the developers said well if i was him what would i want he he kind of stepped back and said all right well imagine i'm this you know older older gentleman right i'm i'm kind of getting on in years right i've got lived a really good life i got a big family right i i i got i got a big tract of land and I, what else, what else do I need? Right. Right. And he's thinking, well, I would probably want something to continue my legacy. Right. I I would want my legacy to continue on because I would be thinking to that point, you know, what, what happens after I'm gone? You know, who's going to take care of my family? Are they going to, are they going to know me? What about my great grandbabies? Right. You know, I may be around for the first couple of years of my life, but how are they going to remember me after that? And so the developer went to this guy and said, "Hey, you know what? What I want to do is I want to I want to honor you in this if you choose to to give this to me, and I want to I want to name this after you, and I want a statue of you in like the the walking park area or whatever." And sure enough, that that got signed over to him like the next day, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, in addition to a large sum of money, don't get me sure, wrong, the I'm money sure. was not nothing. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing that that tipped him over was that sense of importance and it, it took the guy really understanding and caring about you know what what can i really give this old you know, th- this man right as he's reaching the his sunset years what can i give him that's going to be worth it right because money at his age is going to be he's he's got enough right he's he's got enough right it's it's going to be icing on the cake but that's not that's not going to be really what 
he could get excited about it. What's what's an eager want? He's not going to have an eager want for more money, but he's absolutely going to have an eager want for his legacy to continue on. And that's what he was able to give to this this man. It's about making people feel important. And and I've been I've been actually saying this lately. I think I said this to you yesterday, right? I was I was telling you the reason why we created our compose, right? I mean, the, the reason we created our compose is to further the ideas of open source, right? And jumpstart our productivity towards that goal, right? That's something that, that we believe is important. That, you know, that, that kind of legacy that we want to live on, li- leave, leave uh, on. We want to, to push this further because, I, you know, I, yeah. I believe that this is fundamentally going to create a better environment for me, you know, if, if one day I have kids... Right and 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 their kids and and I want this stuff to be available to them. Right, I want to create that ethical, sustainable model for them, and and that's that's that sense of importance, being being a part of the thing that helps free them. Right, as as everything you know, as as my ancestors ancestors have have done stuff to to free me. You know, all all the work and and everything that's gone into to building to where I am today. Right, so if you want to share in that journey, go to ourcompose.com. Right, we're we're going to be talking about this over and over and over again. Right, this is this is what we care about. This is what we do. This is this is who we are. Right, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We'll get this stuff out to you, bring you in, and you can work with us to create that future. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Our Compose Cast. Thank you. Be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.